talking about is are we there yet? And when I was thinking about this journey, I said yesterday, we started in 1999 with a global vision for Bournemouth University, and it was a group of champions who came together to develop a strategy that the university might do something different. And I think when I'm reflecting back on the journey, I can see a lot of pain. And the pain reminds me, I'm sure those of you who've got kids have all experienced, I actually experienced it with very large teenagers who were shaking the car on the motorway because they were hitting each other. But along the way, the journey has had some irritating factors which are not dissimilar to being the driver in a car when you've got kids fighting in the back or kind of conflict. There's been a lot of conflict. But I also think this slide's quite nice because you don't get there in a day. It's just like that expression, Rome wasn't built in a day, and a reminder that it took Moses a long time to lead his people to where they needed to go. So that was quite a nice cartoon, I thought. But the other cartoon actually reminded me that I've grown old in the process. And with the more stress, the more white hairs creep in. And it kind of reminded me that one day you look in the mirror along this journey and you may not recognize who you are, or, or even where you've got to. Uh, so I would suggest that if you, high, if you hook your career on this, it's probably not the best career strategy. An easier career strategy for me would have been to stick with business and management and my learning and teaching role in a business school. So just to remind you briefly of where we were in 2005, and at that point, through my Leadership Foundation Fellowship, we developed this model. Now for those who are interested, it's been written up in loads of places, but the change strategy for Bournemouth is written in this leadership publication. There's a whole chapter on how we developed the change approach. Uh, there's a lot more work in the global university, the role of senior managers, but there's also a publication called the global university, the role of the curriculum. These are all available. If you Google search, you can get this one uh, in PDF. And along the way, we've tried to present uh, proceedings of conferences and make material. The back conferences are still on our website, so please have a look. So it was this idea that we pulled these things together and we started to think about uh, developing the global citizen as someone who understands sustainable development. And that's been quite challenging. We've done a lot of work on looking about, at what are the values and attitudes of the global citizen. What kind of things do they need to do? What's the curriculum? And important to us was the curriculum can focus on global issues, global processes. Within that, we're looking at an internationalized curriculum and sustainable development. And in the early days, we explained to our teams and our senior colleagues that global perspectives was about all these things. It's not dissimilar, except we don't use the C model of Plymouth, but the curricula, the community, campus, and that kind of model. So global perspectives permeated all of these things. And I'll return to some aspects of this diagram and some aspects of this diagram as I go through in trying to evaluate how well we've done. And we established the Center for Global Perspectives, and, and it's been a challenge. It's a center that exists outside of a school and outside of professional services. So it's neither fish nor fowl. As such, you're continually having to justify what it is you're doing and what contribution you're making. You also have to start developing research and engaging with academic concerns, but you're also managing some aspects of professional service concerns. But the purpose of the centre was to work across the university, across institutional. Remember yesterday we highlighted several times how difficult interdisciplinary work actually is. But at the heart of everything we do is this emphasis on interconnections and the interconnected nature of the local and the global, but also the interconnected nature, nature of global issues, uh, the environment, how poverty impacts on, relates to war, how war relates to migration, and trying to suggest that all these big global issues have an impact on any curriculum. But if they're hard, you can't get a purchase in the curriculum where the impact really is, is in employability. So we've done a lot of work linking this to employability. And in that we've been quite powerful and we've worked with people like iGraduate and William Archer because they started telling us way back in 2003, 
that the needs of employers were changing and UK students did not understand global issues. They did not have a world view. They couldn't see the global in the local, they weren't very mobile, they didn't, have, uh, they didn't speak other languages. And as such, over time, they would lose out in the career stakes to young people from mainland Europe. We were also hearing that SMEs were demanding skills in sustainability and they couldn't get them. And they didn't have much time to develop them themselves because if you're an SME, you're too busy surviving. You're focusing on the bottom line. <coughs> so have we been successful? Are we there? Well, some of our successes, and I would say this is a great move if you're trying for an institutional approach, we managed to embed, I'm not saying we've completed embedding, but we set upon strategies to embed all this in the curriculum. And our first success was to build it into academic development and quality guidelines for curriculum development. So course teams have to consider these things when they validate courses and when they go through quinquennial review. In the first few years, it slipped through with largely not much happening. Uh, after about year two, we worked with EDQ and we trained our educational development and quality staff because they are the constant, they are on every panel and every team, they are there administering the review process. Uh, in about year three, we got them to start reporting back how course teams were addressing these issues. Some course teams will do it really well, some course teams will still manage to excuse how they're doing it. Some course teams will say they're doing it but they haven't really understood the terms. So although we can say we have a process and a way that we ensure this is in the curriculum, it doesn't necessarily work. And we don't want to go down the audit culture. We've done some going back and evaluating, but I don't want to go through every, call, every minutes of a validation process. I don't want to do a policing, because that's counter. This policing, auditing view is counter to the ethos, I feel, of what we are trying to do. We've made sure it features in our education enhancement strategy and we've had a lot of success, which I'll come back to in a minute, in getting our, it into our international strategy. But we are currently reviewing these things. So it depends how when we review them, it gets translated again. So that's been a success. Another success, in the early days, we realized staff could not articulate independent learning outcomes. You know when the UK, the UK's greatest contribution to Bologna has been the le learning outcomes. It's about its only great contribution to Bologna. And in the early days of having to articulate learning outcomes, we articulated them badly and then came unstuck when we realised we had to assess them. So then courses reviewed, we got smarter, but staff still found it hard to articulate learning outcomes related to global and sustainable. So we started giving them help. We kind of started building up a data bank of potential learning outcomes, some generic, that would do no damage to the integrity of any discipline. Now, most courses could think about applying critical thinking skills to problems with an international dimension. Most courses could identify the ethical issues that occur in their personal and professional, and not at least the professional spheres. So, Many courses could use decision-making tools to choose between alternative actions, thinking about more sustainable courses of action. So this is just an illustration of some. What makes you successful is giving material to staff, developing material, giving it away. Because in the beginning, staff are too busy. If the curriculum's crowded and our sector is squeezed in terms of resource, you have to have uh, something or some unit which is developing this stuff and giving it free. And we developed seminar exercises which explore attitudes, values and beliefs, a whole range of group work that actually focuses, most courses do group work. Is there some way you can develop something to help them that they could bend very slightly what they're doing to cover these issues? So we started developing resources. There are lots of resources out there. My inspiration back in about 2000 was the Welsh Workers Movement and they had lots of resources, Oxfam, uh, many of the NGOs, so we worked with NGOs and developed some of their resources, many of which are for schools, and then taken them up a level, thinking how do they apply to an HE And we've been very successful in the extracurricular sphere, and we realised early on if we couldn't influence the curriculum, and it would take maybe five years for a course to come up for review, 
we needed to offer things in the extracurricular sphere for those courses that found it really difficult to get these things in um, and while we were waiting for a catch up and we continue to do so I think the extracurricular sphere is really important the challenge with the extracurricular spheres it depends on how much resources you've got so you need to work with your student union you need to work with your students uh, students have lots of ideas they just need someone to help them book rooms uh, make their ideas into reality and at that time we were quite successful in this idea of challenging students to think differently because it linked to our former vice chancellor's brand it was about turning thinking inside out you know, we had lots of branding logo, which was um, see zebras with stripes rather than spots and things like that. So we were able to sell this under the guise of, you know, challenging thinking. And we've done a whole range of things, and these are just a few. With Amanda, I get involved in fair trade, our fair trade committee, fair trade fortnight, but the ongoing educational process. We have Global Citizen Awards, and while they've helped us, reinforce this agenda, we've also linked them to international mobility. So they've been helpful in that aspect. We've worked with student volunteers. One of our Global Citizen Awards has, it's only £100, seed corn funding for students who want to do something in the local, uh, which is about social entrepreneurship and volunteering. Now we talked about, and Marcel talked about privilege yesterday, and it's quite interesting because many of the students that come to us who want to engage with these things are the international students. And they're already going to be ahead in the job market. So it's how we work with the UK students to suggest to them these things will enrich your experience here, but they're also going to be quite important in terms of your future employability. And we hold a range of international events, working, for example, with the Equality and Diversity Officer. Um, uh, when national events come up, like International Women's Day, um, Black History Month, we get involved and get speakers in, just to broaden students' worldviews. So when we set up the centre, it was coincidental, we were restructuring our international office. And Internationalisation have been accused for a long time of focusing on a marketi marketisation discourse. So this gave us an opportunity to make a visible symbol that we were leading the sector in terms of internationalisation by moving away from the economic focus <coughs> of internationalisation onto this broader focus which included things like internationalisation at home, internationalisation abroad, and previous speakers at this conference have included Viv Caruana when she was at Salford. She did the literature review on internationalisation. And Elspeth, who went on, who was at Leeds Matt, has since retired but set up the research centre there um, on internationalisation, which I'm a part of and I think other colleagues have. And they've recently had their big conference at Warwick. So reconstructing the international office meant we took the recruitment aspects of international marketing which was technically marketing we took the recruitment aspects put them in marketing and communications and set up the center for global perspectives which took on some aspects of the role so the international experience uh, international students orientation program students coming in and trying to work on internationalization at home and mobility and the center was set to span academic role and non-academic role and bring them together and thank you John for this picture what we were convinced is the future is local global internationalization is a big issue but all the research was saying HEs need to do more okay so success were we successful in this endeavor well we were successful because in the international strategy global perspectives went to the top and recruitment was featured lower down but that doesn't mean to say, in the reality of things, recruitment became less important. And recently, we're seeing a return of the marketization <coughs> discourse and the economic drivers for internationalization. We've done some good work on mobility, and we've done research on the barriers. And as the paper says, we've identified the barriers to mobility in BU, but the barriers are largely unaddressed. Uh, critical ones are the curriculum structure, which doesn't necessarily match other countries, and believe me, semesterization is not the answer, but is a challenge for us. Uh, accommodation, we, don't, we make it very difficult for students to opt out because they have to sign one-year leases, and fees. And one of our schools offers a fee waiver for students who spend a period of study abroad. 
we did a lot of work enhancing the experience of international students. That's sliding backwards now because we've had restructuring and staffing change. We did quite a lot of work on trying to get environments where UK students learn from international students and vice versa. And that was responding to the surveys that we'd done that said international students feel alienated here. They don't get on with UK students. One of the biggest barriers is that UK students drink a lot. So we did quite a bit of work on that, but over time, that slid a little bit. We've done a lot on internationalising the curriculum. And some of the schools that were later to come to this agenda have moved a long way in the last two years. And I'm thinking of, I've done some great work with Sarah in health, and that's moving on. And design, engineering and computing's moved a long way, and raised us here in trying to in engage with the international agenda. We've done a lot outside of the curriculum on developing cultural awareness. And some courses have built it in specifically, but there's still a long way to go. We've now got a new issue in terms of staff wanting increased cultural awareness, not to deal with international students, but to understand international staff. And something we never do when our international staff come here is ask them, what are the frameworks like in your country? What are your <coughs> pedagogic approaches? We always seek to push them through our model, and we never say, can you offer something that we might do differently? Because if they do something differently and students complain, we see that as wrong because they don't understand our Western way. So there's more work to do there. We try to push the ethos of partnerships based on mutuality and respect. And Paul Luca, a former Pro Vice Chancellor, has actually written on HE needs to engage in a different view. We still have a <coughs> colonial view when we go into other countries in internationalisation. We did some good work, that's recently halted, and the barrier we're hitting against is someone saying that all our partnerships have to come under the jurisdiction of English law. That's slowed our progress down considerably. We have a great Japanese partnership, we've been working with them for ages, and they don't want to sign our memorandum now because we've got this hang, hang up about English law. I have said, if we sign with Harvard, would we say we are, they've got to do English law, not American law? So we have this sticking point. So we've had slips and slides. But what we're convinced of is the link to internationalisation is important, and it's important for employability. But the link to internationalisation is also important for developing students' broader world views and who they are as critical beings and developing their relationship between self and other. The difficulty is there are real challenges in that, not least some of those that Marcel commented on about privilege, but also this idea that they go abroad as tourists and they return worse. I've actually marked the learning journals of students who've gone and settled and studied and had a period abroad and their learning is amazing. But we shouldn't underestimate how painful the experience is and we need to make sure if we offer those opportunities, they're equal. It's kind of equal ops. They're not just for the students who are already middle class who've done all the right things because their parents took them to rugby, dancing, ballet, music, etc. So it's how we make them fair. We've done some evidence. We've got student and staff surveys, students 2009. I reported that on the 2009 conference and staff surveys, which suggests we've made a lot of progress since 2005. There's a better understanding across the piece of the concepts. There's a better understanding of global citizenship. Students are uh, engaged in environments. They have strong environmental concerns, but they're also one of their environmental con their world concerns is war. They're worried about war, terrorism, and poverty. We often talk about our students as they don't care, they're middle class, you know, they don't want to do this, they just want a 2-1 or a first. We should avoid the kind of deficit. I always say we should avoid the deficit model of international students, but we need to avoid the deficit model of our own students. They come with great gifts, and we need to work out. And something I've learned from development education is start from where the learner is. They can't help where they are, that's just where they are. If you don't know where that learner is, you can't take them on a journey. We know we need more staff development workshops, and staff development is a challenge and needs to be ongoing because you have staff turnover all the time. Because internationalisation, due to restructuring, has worked less well of late, uh, I felt less, power, less empowered to do some of the work, we've got on with the work on the, if you remember the early box that said community, environment, etc., we've got on with things in the environment. Um, Joined up working with Amanda and Matt and colleagues in estates, and Amanda and I started out working together when we first set up the centre um, in 2005, has been really successful. 
and that's contributed in part to some of Bournemouth's success, but also Amanda's excellent leadership, because not only is she the environmental manager, but she's a champion and a great leader, so I know she'll be embarrassed, but that working has worked really well. So we've done some really exciting things, and if you're working in your institution, you need, if you're not an environmental manager already, make an ally with that person, join, join up. And we've done some great things, and here's a picture of Geoffrey coming up the stairs with John Burko. We've done some great things in the community. If we haven't been able to engage with internationalisation, we've extended that community sphere. And we've worked with Avonborn School, who've endorsed the Earth Charter. We've worked with the Earth Charter in Bournemouth and the Borough Council. We've organised citizenship days for local schools. And that's linked with AIM Higher, who've also been uh, allies. And we've engaged with local business in a range of events. And the John Burkow event was looking at citizenship and participation in democracy, involving youth and people who might not feel engaged in citizenship within the community. So very quickly, reflecting back, for those that don't know Ron Barnett, he spoke at our first conference. I explained to him that I based my approach on his work. He still couldn't understand it, but he came along. <laughs> couldn't understand how this linked to his own work, so I had to explain it several times. He came along and really riled the audience in posing some challenges. And what we didn't realise till later on, that his thesis that he started work with was actually his antithesis, or it was almost like antichrist to the audience if you were a Christian. Uh, it riled them. And then he went on, but he did some good work pointing out where the problems are with this agenda. Uh, but he was an expert in education, but neither the concepts. We've had Doug involved since the beginning. You might recognise Betty Lee from Australia. They've done great work. She helped us quite a lot in developing learning outcomes. And you recognise Stephen, who's always been in the frame, critiquing more from the sustainable in the early days and environmental, but's come out to this broader agenda. And David Killick from Leeds Matt, who's done great work on the uh, internationalisation, but this idea that you might develop a global soul. So reflecting back, have we addressed the tensions? Well, they're still there. And you'll see I've articulated in the paper. But Ron looked at the tensions between sustainability and global citizenship. And he said, where do they overlap? Maybe they overlap around social justice and fairness. And then he looked at the relationship between these subjects, asking if they were universal themes. Could you apply them to every discipline? And that's the challenge. Someone said maths the other day. Could you put global and cultural? And I said, well, who invented the abacus? You know, we tend to teach accountancy here, but do we ever tell them? Have we ever? I actually got someone in to demonstrate how to use an abacus once they could do things quicker than an accountant. And it was just amazing. And some of the things we came up with was tentatively to suggest that sustainability was about epistemological concerns, ways of knowing and knowledge, and citizenship was more ontological, ways of being and trying to change beings. But that's not quite right, because it actually depends on how you define sustainability. And some people define sustainability. If you look at the work of Bear and Scott on ESD1 and ESD2, you start to understand more about sustainability. But at Bournemouth, we've always used this idea that it's about developing critical beings in the sense used by Barnett, who can understand super complexity in the sense used by Barnett in his second book. And then we've added some of the Bear and Scott's work on explaining what ESD1 and ESD2 so along the way, uh, I'm going to cut very soon. How many? I had to read at 18. I had to read Dante in Italian. With, I didn't even know there was an English translation. And there was no internet or Google. So I actually wandered through the inferno. Nice picture of the dark wood. Uh, we spent a lot of the journey in the dark wood. Staff changes, particularly leadership, mean you're continually having to resell yourself. We've restructuring, and you might have heard of Moss Cantor's work, Learn to Dance on a Shifting Carpet, When Elephants <coughs> Dance. I have felt that half the time I've been on a moving carpet, and the only way to survive is being that flexible. We come up against silo mentality, and our internal funding mechanisms reinforce silo mentality. We have the tussle between what should be centralised and decentralised, and we've gone in wrong directions. If someone asks you, it may work in some institutions, but I was set off to develop a capstone unit for the whole university. That causes a lot of conflict because it challenged the funding model. And I heard 
time last week, in terms of your mobile phone, you can be in a not spot. I've never heard of a not spot before, uh, but I kind of move from not spots to hot spots where the signal's loud and clear. You know, you'll spend some time with no signal at all, wondering why on earth you've got a mobile phone and what you're doing. Networks are important friends and allies. Aligning agendas is critical. External funding just gives you a bit more credibility. Student energy, tap into it. Students are such creative, lovely people. We don't get to spend enough time with them. <laughs> Developing resources and giving stuff away and working with the environment team. So have we got there? Well, I've used that quote for the Earth Charter because I say we've got a long way to go and it's conferences like this that allow us to bring together our collective wisdom. I have some optimism because this is in the new vision and values and it actually says that Bournemouth, it mentions global perspectives and global citizens, societal challenges and shaping society in our vision and values. Now that's big, but whether we're successful and whether my centre exists depends on the next strategies. What does the structure look like and what's the education enhancement strategy going to be and what's the international strategy going to be? I don't hold out great hope at the moment for the international strategy, but I'm working on it.